Thank you for joining the Acquia webinar, Building a Compliance and AppSec Program for a Federal Platform as a Service. My name is Chris Hughes. I'm the CISO and co-founder at Acquia. And today I'm joined by a panel of folks from the industry, Lloyd Evans, uh, Brian Kroger, and Keith Busby. So I'm going to go around the horn a little bit here first. Uh, Keith, you mind telling us a bit about your background, your role, and what you're up to? Uh, sure. So uh, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to the, the co-panelists. Um, so Keith Busby, I am currently the, the director of the Division of Security and Privacy Compliance, a really long, fancy title for CMS. Um, we, my division is responsible for the uh, authorization assessment activities for, for our FISMA systems, as well as training and awareness programs, FedRAMP sponsorship, and uh, a, a new program, um, SAS governance. So I, um, I got into IT about uh, 20 years ago, makes me feel really old. I uh, started out in the military, worked kind of my, my way up through um, the civilian ranks from like help desk, desktop, desktop support to, uh, to my current role. Excellent. Br Brian, you want to go ahead and uh, go next? Yeah, Brian Kroger, CEO and uh, founder of Rise8. Uh, we're a software services company. We help customers in the government ship game-changing software through culture-changing process. And uh, prior to this, I spent 10 years in the Air Force, uh, the last three of which uh, I co-founded Kessel Run and um, scaled that to a rather large uh, software factory that it is today. And uh, I'm also a father of four, so I stay pretty busy outside of work too. Awesome. As a father of four, I know exactly what you mean, uh, for better or worse. And then Lloyd, last but not least, do you mind telling us a bit about your background, Lloyd? Hello, I'm Lloyd Evans, a Principal Information System Security Officer at Acquia. I'm currently uh, also the Principal ISO and Tech Lead for a security team uh, for a platform as a service within CMS, uh, and I'm currently building out uh, compliance uh, and AppSec uh, you know, programs for, for, for that project. I came up in my career through the Air Force, uh, did some contracting, and really, you know, started uh, carving out uh, my cybersecurity career. So it's very nice to speak alongside everyone here. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. We're excited to have you al along with everyone else. And, you know, the, obviously the title of the show is, uh, you know, building a compliance and AppSec program for federal platform as a service. Uh, for folks that aren't familiar with that, you know, Brian used the term software factories, another term that you'll often hear, you know, referring to these uh, platform as a service or PaaS offerings in the federal space. Uh, and often, you know, what happens is organizations like federal agencies and mission owners uh, departments, they'll build, you know, a cloud native system on top of an underlying like infrastructure as a service like AWS and Azure and others uh, to kind of a streamline and uh, uh, expedite essentially software delivery in the federal space, you know, let people come onto these platforms, uh, you know, inherit sec security controls, you know, have a platform engineering team supporting them and things of that nature. So I wanted to set that context, you know, before we use the term PaaS or software factory too much. Uh, but I want to ask you guys, you know, before we dive into any particular topics and questions, you know, what kind of differentiates a PaaS, you know, in its ability to deliver compliance and app outcomes, you know, versus traditional, you know, programs where we may see development teams trying to deploy software in the federal space? And I'll open it up to whoever wants to uh, jump in first there. I'll, I'll take this one first. I think um, the first I would say on, on the staff, software factory piece, we often have a contrarian opinion of, of what a software factory is because, what good's like an assembly line that doesn't produce anything? Like a software factory or you know, a, a car factory is a, a thing that produces cars. So like a platform or a PaaS doesn't produce software. Um, the factory itself includes people, process, culture, uh, and technology, right? And part of that's an assembly line. And then there's all sorts of other technology that comes into that as well. Um, like your backend business systems and all kinds of things that have to be in place to effectively run a, a great software organization and government. On the PaaS piece, though, in particular, I think, um, you know, the very classic definition of like infrastructure and platform as a service was actually as a service call over the network um, got shortened to, to as a service. I think that's really important, really makes it so that uh, developer teams can get everything that they need to perform their application development as a service call, right, as an API call. Um, Obviously, that's the Shangri-La to be able to do it with everything um, in federal. You know, it's often a journey to get there because the capabilities we're able to pull over from commercial, especially as we go into secret and top secret environments, you lose a lot of those commercial capabilities or APIs that you could normally call. And you have to start either doing some things manually or building out that automation yourself. But to me, the end goal, why it's so important is because 
uh, that frees up developers' time to focus on other things. Developers are never going to focus on security if like deploying to prod is just always a dumpster fire and they're always three months behind. And so the more that we can eliminate all of that toil, the more we can get them to focus on compliance and security. And um, I think that's important because, you know, I, I focus on all of federal, but like my heart is uh, as a veteran is on war fighters and I want to get capabilities in the hands of war fighters uh, continuously and to do continuous delivery in federal government requires a continuous ATO, which is a buzzword that I'm going to say depends on doing continuous RMF uh, or some type of uh, compliance and security program. And so you have to get those things down to be able to actually continuously deliver to your, your customers who need it so desperately. So I, I love your your continuous RMF there because you know, right now compliance world and um, I think that the biggest hurdle right now for, for developers for ADOs in from a compliance side is interpretation and understanding right and so they they feel as though they read this or somebody read this that you have to do this and like we don't say that we're just document what you're going to do and then follow it so that we can come back and check that you're doing it. Right? That's ultimately all we really care about. We don't care how you're doing it. Just document that you're doing it because of why. And we'll come back and make sure that you're following along with that. And I think that's how we get into that, that continuous ATO or ongoing authorization or all these different terms is those things, those, those repeatable tests to verify that you're doing what you're saying you're doing. Because compliance only exists because at some point in time, somebody did not do what they were supposed to do. Completely agree as well. And I think one of the benefits of a, of a platform in terms of the abstracted uh, infrastructure and kind of freeing up the developer, you know, time to focus more on developing their application, you know, tying that abstraction to security controls in whichever context, uh, you know, you're at within the federal government that provides a, uh, a specific way, you know, that applications can kind of come in, standardize and fulfill those controls uh, by onboarding to the platform uh, that takes really lifts that compliance burden uh, from their the application team as a whole to include their security personnel to focus on the things that matters most to them. So it's in, everyone has mentioned federal government so far, and it's interesting because every every agency, every optive, whatever the, the term is, does it differently, right? And so we can't just say federal government because that's that's one large bucket that not everyone fits into. <laughs> Yeah, I don't disagree there. It's a massive ecosystem with a lot of different, uh, you know, personalities, processes, and ways of doing things, most certainly. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, you know, you know, Brian used the term Shangri-La, and I think it was kind of timely because <clears throat> we talked about, like, how we're trying to do these things and how great it is and how much it makes life easier for development teams. But anyone who's done these uh, in large, complex federal environments knows that it doesn't go quite so uh, shining, you know, or quite so easily like that. So I'm curious, you know, from each of your perspectives, whether it's in the DOD side, the federal agency side, you know, what are some of the specific challenges that you've encountered trying to, you know, kind of create and scale a, a compliance and application security program for one of these PaaS or software factories? I can take this one first. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, that, that I've put a lot of effort into providing solutions for is building relationships between security personnel, developers, and infrastructure engineers, uh, and handling compliance topics specifically uh, to really maximize the time value that you're getting out of any kind of overlapping meetings or, or work, work that you're working through to tie that abstracted infrastructure or particular pieces uh, of your paths to your compliance requirements. Uh, really building those relationships is extremely important. Uh, and enabling kind of a, almost like a, a anyone can lead from whichever position they're at, uh, you know, kind of taking ownership of their particular piece of responsibility and really driving that to the best version possible uh, rather than having, you know, leadership skills or kind of leadership decisions solely rely at the top. There's certainly decisions that need to be, uh, you know, tied to a specific you know, person or position, but really enabling everyone to, to lead from, from where they're at. And I, I think we found a lot of success in our, in our program of producing that type of atmosphere. So, so for me, we get involved too late in the game. That's the biggest struggle that we come up with. Um, an ADO is brought on, a contract's hired or, or released, whatever. We don't, we don't find out until a system wants an authorization usually. They're like, hey, we've been doing this thing. And so then everything was built and designed and, and documented 
based off of somebody's interpretation of how they expect us to get it. And generally we, we don't, we don't necessarily care. Like, is it in, you know, this format or something, but we at least need to have an understanding of, of the approach and how you guys went about it. And I think that that's one area that at least at CMS, we need, need to do a better job of, of getting in front of it instead of finding out about it at the end. Yeah. And I think um, my number one challenge is, is what Lloyd said. Uh, you know, the, the technical implementations here are, are I don't want to say easy, um, but uh, they're not that complex. Uh, they're relatively well understood. We've got a lot of patterns, playbooks, recipes. Um, it's all pretty straightforward is maybe how I'll say it. Um, the hard part is is getting the buy-in, establishing the trust, and, and ultimately getting somebody to sign off on the authorization. Um, and uh, since Lloyd talked about that, maybe the, the one I'll add is, um, you know, every all, all of the automation that you build around or on top of your paths for the compliance portion, I, I think you should consider that part of your paths. Um, it's just another API, like another service call over the network for developers um, to be able to reduce toil as it relates to compliance. And uh, the struggle that I'm seeing is getting um, particularly uh, DOD customers to invest in those in the same way they're willing to invest in platform. And frankly, I mean, I, I've been on the record many times saying like federal government's over investing in like DIY platforms right now. Um, so the resources are already spread thin. So, you know, if you're going to do something like this, if you want to have a true CRMF, uh, like secure release pipeline, and I use pipeline uh, in, in a very limited sense, I think that usually calls to mind like a build pipeline or a CI pipeline, but I just mean automation that's going to trigger a series of jobs, in this case, mostly compliance and security related. Um, that's, well, the technical implementation is not that complex. It becomes a, a, a critical dependency for every single application team that wants to deploy to staging and production. And so it needs to have a great lead time deployment frequency for like new features to be able to support new app teams. Um, it needs to have good mean time to restore, low change fail rates, and high reliability, right? All the same Dora metrics that we want to measure app teams on, almost every platform service needs to be measured on. And achieving good metrics in those spaces is even perhaps more difficult. And um, you, you just need a really strong investment in both uh, what I'll generally call platform development and platform operations. And we're just seeing massive underinvestment and these secure release pipelines become brittle and frail and they slow teams down instead of speeding them up. Yeah, you guys actually all said something uh, that was kind of loosely related to one another in the sense that uh, the technology may be the easier part or at least the more straightforward part. Uh, and But when we look in our industry, like most of the conversation is around cloud and Kubernetes and containers and pipelines and uh, is, you know, service mesh and all these things, you know, why do we avoid the people aspect so much? You know, Keith talked about the problematic you know, aspect of being brought into the picture too late. You know, that's a long age old security problem of bolted on versus built in. It happens culturally too. You know, why do you think we neglect the people aspect so much when it's so critical? Because people can't solve the people problem. I mean, Right. I, it sounds weird, but it's the truth, right? Like relationships are hard to build. Personalities are hard to learn. There are, I mean, there, there's easy people, there's difficult people, there's misunderstandings, there's, there's everything. People, people are always going to be the, the, I say problem, but that's, it makes it sound like there's a problem with people, but that's not what I'm intending. It's just, you know, there's, that's the, the biggest hurdle to overcome. Yeah, and I'll say from the industry side, right, um, it's hard to sell. And that's why most people in industry don't try to sell it. I try to stay, uh, you know, really principled and, and focus on that. And I tell you, it's, it's a hard sales journey. Um, but you end up with better customers as a result. So um, I don't know, I guess for the industry folks out there, what I would say is if, if you stay true to those principles, um, you might have like a, a smaller customer pool, but it's a better customer pool of people that are actually bought into the people changes um, cause they know that's their problem and it's easy to sell that to them. So, um, let that self-selection happen would be, would be my advice. And I think the more that, uh, the folks on the industry side, certainly there's a government portion too, but I'll let government always, you know, speak to, to that problem. But on our side, I think we're too willing to sell what people are buying, uh, instead of what they actually need. Yeah. And I, I would just add on to that for, you know, anyone who's listening, something that has been very successful 
uh, that I've noticed in, in my journey, at least, uh, is, is so I read about like 50 50 and it's probably 60 40, you know, somewhat leadership to technical materials. And I've found time and time again that the, the tools and skills that I learn uh, from you know, people who speak on leadership, from books, you know, talking about leadership, uh, sometimes those solve situations, uh, you know, uh, to, to a far greater degree uh, than some of the technical materials that I read in practice. And that doesn't, that isn't gated, you know, you can do that at any level you want. If you want to start, if you're starting at entry level, if you're starting at mid level, if you're, you know, trying to, you know, pursue, uh, you know, management, whatever that role looks like for you, um, I, I would just I, I encourage you to maybe add some uh, leadership materials to your reading mix. Well, yeah. Management and leadership are two different things, right? Like anybody can be a leader at any given level. Yeah, I think you guys are spot on there. And I want to make a little plug for a book called Hack Your Bureau Bureaucracy that kind of talks about this. And it, it goes bi directionally in the sense that like you can lead from any level, but also if you're trying to come in and make an impact, he's got it on the background there. If you're trying to come in and make an impact in the organization, like it's very critical to connect with the people on the ground doing the work too, not just the leaders. Like they understand the toil, the difficulties, the burdens and processes, how to, you know, make things flow and work in an organization. They've been around a long time often. Uh, so I think that that's key to making those impacts that we're talking about in terms of the culture too. Um, so one other topic I wanted to bring up to you guys is uh, in these, you know, PaaS or software factory, you know, systems that we build in the federal ecosystem, you know, security control inheritance is a hot topic, you know, as part of alleviating the burden on development teams, you know, allowing people to inherit controls from the IaaS, the PaaS, and just focus on a subset of the overall, you know, security controls of the NIST 853, you know, security control baselines, for example. You know, why is that so important to alleviating the burden on developers? And also, you know, at the same time, what are some common misperceptions and, you know, kind of maybe misaligned uh, implementations when it comes to security control inheritance? <laughs> One of the biggest misalignments is people uh, saying they're inheriting con security controls that aren't documented uh, anywhere. Um, and just like a general um, lack of knowledge and understanding of, of NIST uh, policy and guidance um, documentation, uh, I always encourage people to actually go and read NIST. Um, their documentation is actually really solid as much as I'm not like a person that loves to sit and read, uh, like, like the FAR that I would not recommend that to everybody, but, um, NIST 800 series is, is generally, um, really solid. And when it comes to, uh, common controls inheritance, you actually need to plan for that up front in the prepare stage. Um, and that often gets overlooked and like you, you need to specifically choose that authorization type common control provider. Um, I mean, you don't have to, if, you, if you're just doing it within your organization, like, I suppose it's not that important, but if you're going to be a provider to other third party applications or services, um, you really need to go through the formal process of becoming a common controls provider from like a NIST 800 perspective. Um, and then, uh, as to why it's so important, I think if you can map out that inheritance, you make a lot of these things that we want to do a lot easier. So like multi-cloud, for instance, if I want to deploy my application across multiple cloud environments, those environments are inevitably going to be configured differently. Um, aside from the fact that they're, you know, slightly different technologies, but I mean, like people don't realize how much control uh, implementation happens at the configuration level. So if you've got three different teams, three different vendors managing three different cloud providers and have different implementations, and you're likely going to have different uh, you know, risk postures or control inheritance that you have available to you. And then when you add platform layers, like the Kubernetes layer of D2IQ, Rancher, Tanzu, all of those, you have these a huge amount of options. And now you've got app developers that you're saying, I want you to deploy to these three environments. And they're like, I have no idea like what controls I'm responsible for in each of those environments. So the more that we can make that inheritance, not only um, like well-documented, but easy for application developers to understand and hopefully pull into their backlog as actual developer tasks, um, the more likely it is that we can seamlessly deploy in a multi-cloud or multi-platform environment. And I think that's really important. Yeah, you said something interesting, having making sure that the, the ADOs, the developer understand. So one of the, the big issues that we run into is if something's fully inheritable, people just go, I don't have to worry about it. And, and Yes, we're easing the burden, but you still need to be aware of what somebody's doing to make sure what your responsibility is, because there there is a dividing line on there. And then hybrid opens a whole new can of worms, right? Is if you're not well documenting what you're doing and what they're responsible for, and then when you layer in like 
FedRAMP CSP with with a, a GSS that's doing some things on the infra side, and then you get the, the ADO that like that level keeps getting passed further and further down as to who's doing what. It just it gets hard to to understand what each layer is doing. Yeah, to, to, totally agree with what you both are saying. Uh, coordinating between different stakeholders who are providing inheritance, you know, between your uh, IAS layer, you know, if you have uh, a PaaS on top of that, um, you know, identity providers associated, all the the mixture of, of shared control providers that an ADO is taking on. Uh, oftentimes, federal GRC systems don't really enable an accurate picture for that. And for the most part, you know, an application, uh, you know, they just want all this abstracted away. They just want to, you know, know what their responsibilities are in terms of inheritance, uh, but that could be totally different for your enterprise or the, you know, control providers working alongside each other, trying to delineate responsibilities from themselves that maybe the application uh, team doesn't necessarily see, but still are very critical to the the data day operations, uh, you know, so there's, you know, certain things, there's uh, uh, programs out there, you know, seeking to improve this uh, type of field. And there's some exciting things, uh, you know, like OSCAL, which can hopefully facilitate, you know, a, a, a more uh, machine readable look at security controls inheritance. Um, something that, that Brian touched on too, that I really liked was uh, placing, uh, you know, or kind of following off a comment he made on configuration, you know, placing a strong emphasis on, really reducing the configuration drift between your implementation uh, you know, from the start. Uh, it's extremely important you know, kind of to map your entire PaaS tool stack to your compliance requirements, but then keeping that configuration drift really dialed in because uh, not everything, especially at the start of a project can be automated immediately. So really setting the foundation for those strong manual processes that you can then enable to automate, you know, when you're, when you have the the cycles in between delivering to your application teams. Um, I think that's, that's very much the way forward. Yeah. Quick, like plug for a great government organization on that is the DISA hack. Um, I think a lot of people overlook it either because they don't know about it or because DISA is in front of it. Uh, not trying to be mean, but um, DISA hack is a great organization. And they have built out uh, infrastructure as code templates um, and given those uh, provisional ATOs from DISA, like at IL-4, IL-5. What's great about that, I saw a question um, from Paul Puckett about, you know, where have we seen solid automated testing and documentation to validate control inheritance? Uh, not really much of anywhere. Um, there's like a few small edge cases that I, I can say, you know, we do as much of that as is feasible, but there's not really like a great shared common repository of, of that kind of information. And one of it is one of the reasons is because every single government cloud environment has different configuration. And so I think the more that we can move towards um, things like DisaHack uh, infrastructure as code templates that have a provisional ATO is now I can verify configuration drift, right? Like I can run scripts against that and verify that you're still running that configuration and that your controls are still valid, which is also a controls monitoring piece, but um, I think takes it a step further than what we traditionally talk about when we say controls monitoring. And you can start going up the stack with that too, but if you don't do it at the infrastructure as code layer, you really have str struggle doing it uh, at higher layers in the stack. And, you know, there's great, uh, like Red Hat has a great Kubernetes operator, um, that, that I encourage people to look into, a compliance operator rather. Um, and there's some other folks that are working on the same thing. And, and honestly, on the, you know, Lloyd, you mentioned the, the platforms, like GRC platforms. We haven't really found anything that does a great job um, with controls inheritance and modularity. We actually built one ourselves um, that we'll like be launching soon here, but uh, we kept finding this problem over and over and over again in every customer engagement, we we're having to rebuild it. So. Uh, uh, if anybody in the community is interested, I would love to to work with them to build out more of a common repository or body of knowledge um, as it relates to specific control packages that we can inherit and test against. Yeah, you guys said a lot of great points there in terms of, you know, kind of having that repeatable infrastructure as code that has a provisional authorization that can be taken and, you know, kind of alleviate and codify the deployment process of, you know, uh, a secure environment that you have documented controls for. Uh, but as Keith and Lloyd talked about, that configuration drift is what's going to really come into play there, because if you modify those configurations, you know, you know, you have to go back and revisit how you've documented controls because you've now broken that model. So I would say if, it, if it's if it's that best practice that that those secure configuration settings shouldn't they just be the the initial configuration and and 
changing out of that is the base and that that's from like the csp level right so when when a new account new resource whatever stood up in aws why not just have those configs already there and then and they can i mean and then someone can deviate from that if it's a good config i will charge the hill with you <laughs> i think <laughs> the problem that i've seen is that there's so many bad configs out there and like um you know like AWS org policies are all over the map in these environments. And there are so many of them that when I walk in, like it's, it's literally impossible to do DevOps, right? I mean, the, the NIST definition of cloud compute is like the first two statements are self-service and on-demand. And most of the government uh, like enterprise clouds are neither self-service nor on-demand because of the way that they've implemented org policy, like at a root account level. And then you're stuck in that. Now you come in and provision resources on top of that and you're stuck with it and you, you can't, you can barely do agile software development, let alone DevOps, uh, just because of the way it's locked down. So I don't know if Brian uh, perused my LinkedIn and kind of poked my my language or what, but just this morning I commented how you know NIST's ten year old definition of cloud computing, eight hundred one forty five, talks about self service and on demand, and the government never gets those two parts right ever. Um, you know, anyways, uh, I wanted to ask you guys a question too. We've talked about doing this right for a development team, and Keith has used the term ADO by the way, which is kind of a, an application development organization in the CMS context. By the way, for folks that don't know that term. Um, you know, so it's one thing to do this for a single development team or a single mission owner or system owner, but, you know, often it's uh, a much another, a dif different story in terms of complexity and challenge to try to do this at scale across many teams in an organization or an agency. You know, what do you think are some of the, the complexities and challenges of trying to do this at scale for many teams versus just, you know, a couple apps, a couple simple basic apps, that kind of thing? So at scale, everybody has their different opinions of, of what they need and how they want to do it. They also have a different level of risk appetite. So someone may want to be more strict. Someone may maybe need it to be more lenient, right? They may have an, a, an immediate fix that needs to be pushed, whatever it may be. So it's just, there are so many different uh, dissenting opinions on, on, you know, what they need, how they need it, when they need it, that, that it's hard to satisfy and then cost, right? So, so all of these people, or all of these systems are going to cost a different amount and you start adding them onto, onto a pass who, who pays for it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, one of the quotes that comes to mind here that I've heard a few different people say uh, in, in different kinds of ways, but we follow the quality of our systems, uh, you know, both automated and manual. Uh, so in terms of building those systems from the ground up, uh, you know, thinking through what the problems we are trying to solve, building reusable components, uh, you know, whatever aspect that that may be, whether that's, you know, people processes, uh, you know, system processes, you know, with their system, you know, leading towards automated checks. Uh, once the, you know, kind of process is thought through, the problem statement uh, is, is developed and, and, and following through on a solution for those and then standardizing them out to customers. And kind of as Keith was saying, uh, you, you might have customers that are asking for different things. And I think that that's something within uh, the, the federal sector that's, that's very, very key uh, that sometimes you don't see as often as you would like is customer obsession, you know, listening to your customers' problems, really diving in, uh, getting to the meat of the problem that they are trying to solve and then enabling solutions for them uh, instead of, uh, you know, sometimes you know, it could be customer-driven development where it's just, oh, someone asked something, we're going to deliver that, you know, kind of really getting to the underlying meat uh, of how to best service our customers. I'm, uh, I'm like in the middle of writing an, an article about this, actually. So um, a few things that I've noticed number one is authorization boundaries. Um, I think that especially when you're trying to build a centralized IT, you know, whether it's uh, infrastructure or platform uh, for application developers, uh, inevitably there's a different authorizing official for the apps that are trying to deploy there. The like way that I think the government tried to approach this for the last two or three years is to increase the authorization boundary and make that like one AO in charge of every app that deploys on there. Um, and then the people that won't adopt that want it to be all theirs. Like I, I wanna own the authorization boundary and review all of your uh, controls for your platform as a service, where we need to be meeting in the middle with a shared responsibility model and having two AOs sign off um, on like, this is what I'm responsible for, this is what you're responsible for, and this is a shared responsibility, making that clear so that everyone feels safe. 
um, and isn't actually taking risks. I really get tired of hearing people, oh, we just need to take more risk. It's like, no, it's actually really bad advice. Uh, we need to manage risk. Uh, I don't actually recommend taking more risk. And I think that you can be less risky and go faster. And in fact, a lot of times speed reduces risk. So um, it's just like a lot of these old tropes and, and uh, like silly arguments. The other one is shadow IT. Um, now I have to be careful here because you often hear me comment that I don't believe in like trying to shut down shadow IT. Uh, I do believe in doing so if it's not practicing compliance and security though. And I think one thing that we're seeing happen in, in terms of getting adoption is these other people aren't having to do any compliance or security at all. And even though we've made an AppSec program that makes it way easier to do NIST RMF than what they're used to or, or give your compliance framework, um, they're used to doing nothing. And so that's like a significant barrier to adoption. And they're like, no, I'm just gonna keep doing my shadow IT over here. Uh, so making sure you have that in check is really good. Um, I think EMAS was going to Lloyd's point about falling victim to our systems or, or however he phrased that. Uh, I've been guilty of just like criticizing EMAS, but like EMAS is gonna stick around and I'm trying to do a better job. In fact, reaching out to the current uh, incumbent and, and some other folks, they actually have APIs, I found out, which, I, you know, is like not that well known or understood. Good APIs, I mean, like usable APIs, um, and they're developing more and they're actually working on doing some really innovative things. And I think we all need to be lobbying like the whole of government and DISA and everybody to leverage better requirements on them because it's a rather waterfall contract and it would be a lot better if, if we all helped out there. And I think that probably applies to federal agencies using other centralized repositories for control documentation. Um, and then two more that I'll mention really quickly. One's like the calculator problem. People that learn to do math on a calculator and never learned how to do it, uh, they, they tend to not know when the calculator is giving them errors or giving them bad information. And uh, I think Keith, you mentioned this earlier is, you know, with the hybrid problem like people have to understand what's going on behind the scenes of what they're inheriting and also what they're doing. Um, and a lot of these programs are creating folks that don't have the like base level foundational knowledge. I haven't quite figured out how to solve this problem other than like formal education or like meeting with security assessors, which doesn't appeal to most uh, ADOs. Um, and uh, so, so that's another one. The last one's the most important though, and that's PaaS. Um, in order to bring a bunch of apps onto your platform, you have either have to make it really flexible or you have to force them to redevelop it into your technical opinions, one or the other. Both take a really long time. And I'm seeing a ton of premature like mandates, like thou shalt use this platform. And it's like, whoa, 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 your platform can't support that language even, uh, or your pipeline can't support scanning that application or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then you're stuck in this quandary of like either the platform team has to get more resources so they can build out a more robust platform offering or the app team has to redevelop their application. I was See just going to, you just said what I, is the platform even resource to, to support those, right? The, the way government contracting work blows my mind. It's like, oh, we're going to do this thing, but they're actually not going to bring resources on to do the thing that we just hired you to do for like six months. And so it's like, awesome, you have to go on this platform, but we're not ready for you yet. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, it's kind of an uncomfortable truth, at least in my experience in the DOD and federal agency that like, sometimes these platforms are not necessarily a good fit for every development team too. And like, you know, it, it, it is opinion, opinionated and it won't always be the right solution or hosting environment for every single development team. And, you know, there's a balance between, you know, trying to uh, grow adoption and use and, and, you know, governance, but also like having the flexibility to let people get their job done, deliver on, on their, you know, their mission or their requirements. And I think that that's often a kind of a point of friction within the organization too. And then real quick, Brent, you had mentioned um, formal education, contractors and, and ADOs or, or developers change out, right. And the system lives on. And so that, that creates a never ending training cycle where people are not going to understand the intention, the decisions that were made, why they were made, why we're doing it this way. And so it, it causes more friction. Yep. Yeah. So speaking of friction, it's funny you said that word because my next question talks about, uh, you know, there's always this a, a bit of friction or, you know, challenge between the developers and the security and compliance teams when it comes to, you know, meeting requirements and compliance requirements when they're trying to deliver software through pipelines and things like that. Uh, you know, managing vulnerabilities. I know Lloyd is, uh, you know, particularly focused on this one lately, like managing vulnerabilities at scale with all the robust pipeline toolings of SAS and DAS and secret scanning and SBOM and on and on and on. Like, how do we, you know, kind of enable developers 
to you know, move quickly on their mission and deliver value for the agency, but also meet the security requirements and, and, and give them contextualized vulnerability information that actually is meaningful and actionable versus just dumping a bunch of data on them and telling them, figure it out, or you got pro am it. Yeah, so uh, one of the my favorite pieces of adv- favorite pieces of advice that I've heard in the last few months uh, is you will be amazed how smart people think you are by simply preparing ten to fifteen minutes for upcoming meetings. Uh, that's something that like we did religiously as a security team before meeting with our developers as we were working through what security controls inheritance for our platform stack. Uh, we were very much prepared uh, to be able to maximize the quality of the time that we were spending with them, um, and I think you know. I've, I've spoke a lot on compliance, you know, and we have both compliance and AppSec, uh, you know, for, for this webinar. And I think for the AppSec side, it's really staying data driven, um, using things like EPSS to enrich raw CVE fee, uh, feeds that are coming out from uh, vulnerability scanners. Sometimes they can be incredibly noisy. And, you know, instead of just dropping down, hey, you know, welcome to our platform. Here's, you know, thousands of vulnerabilities or hundreds or whichever it is. Good luck, you know, really giving them the, the tools that they need to prioritize the the best quality efforts that they're going to have in terms of securing their application, because that's ultimately, ultimately what we're trying to accomplish for our customers is providing a way from, for them that you know takes away some of the management of these tools and really enables them to focus on, on building more secure applications. Uh, and then as far as minimizing friction, uh, one of my favorite things that we've been doing is just trying to stay humorous, uh, you know, whether that's just some really good spicy memes or, you know, just uh, security can be kind of like a, you know, it can be dry sometimes. Uh, I have, uh, uh, read, you know, the NIST documents that Brian has mentioned and, and recommended here. And sometimes you just got to have like a humorous aspect, especially uh, when you're trying to communicate the, you know, how that all relates to a developer or, you know, an application PM. Anything from you, Keith or Brian, on that topic? So one, to minimize friction, if we could just get everyone to understand that security and compliance is always right, that would just, just remove all friction. Um, See, I'm already taking your humor advice, Lloyd. <clears throat> um, as far as you had mentioned, like AppSec and, and using EPSS, even EPSS isn't enough, right? We do these credential scans. We do all these pipeline tools checking for flaws and vulnerabilities. And they're, they're, they're credentialed. They're very point in time. They're very targeted. And it doesn't take in the entire... Uh, mitigating control factor, right? So is it public, publicly accessible? Is there a WAF in front of it? Is there whatever? I don't know. A bunch of other technology buzzwords. But we, we don't look at the whole picture when we're forcing this work on the people, right? It's like, hey, your system has all these flaws. We don't care about all the other layers that you build in. And I think that's where a lot of friction comes in. It's that we're never satisfied and we just give them more work on a reoccurring basis. Yeah, uh, I'll kind of add to that. I, I think one thing we have to do is change the narrative. Like Keith's initial joke is like part true. I think um, like doing what's required is not friction. It's only friction if you weren't doing it before, which is a problem. Um, and the pushback I get on that a lot is mostly on the compliance side. There's like a whole tranche of people in the innovation ecosystem right now that like to go around and say like, Compliance is not security. And, uh, you know, they make grandma EMAS jokes. Again, I've been guilty of that one in particular. So I take that. But um, the, the thing here is you like known issues. We, we get so wrapped up in agile, right? There's like this spectrum of, of like new emerging technology. And then on the other side, commoditization. And like on the left side of that, agile works really well. On the right side of that, we practice Lean Six Sigma. Like nobody would ever walk into a car factory and be like, oh, let's be agile about how we build this car. Like, no, let's be Lean Six Sigma and minimize defects. There's a bunch of known issues. Like, let's plan for that. Well, in cybersecurity, it turns out there's many known issues, known vulnerabilities. And so to say, like, we shouldn't have a checklist for that. Like, would you tell an aircraft maintainer that's, you know, the flight you're about to take to just not follow its checklist? It's ridiculous. And so, like, these narratives have gotten a little out of control with, with folks on like my side of, you know, the app dev uh, folks that lean app dev, kind of the culture around innovation right now and, and agility. Um, and I think bringing that closer to the center, not all the way to Keith's side, but right in between us here uh, it, it is really helpful. And, and two things that are really good practices that people can implement today to really help that outside of like 
the way we talk is important. And I think the, the words we choose, the way we speak is important, but also balance teams. Like, especially if you have an early team or a technically complex team um, piloting something, really great to just put an assessor on the team. We practice pair programming. So it's really easy for us to pair in like a technical assessor. Um, they're not gonna be writing much code. They're gonna be rubber ducking for their pair a lot of times. Um, but it gives them a lot of exposure, trust, transparency, et cetera. The second thing I recommend that you can do right away is, is more transparency, the better. I was afraid for like many years of my career about weaponized transparency. Um, but what I found is that if you can just be as transparent as possible, I'm talking about giving access to assessors. This assumes you've set up this like technical pipeline that I've talked about and, and you have the right kind of things going on. Um, giving them access to your backlogs, to your repos, to your control scanners, letting them set the rule sets for them. Uh, and, you know, having some sort of compliance management system where they can have traceable identifiers from like control to implementation. I think the more that you can do that, um, the less friction you end up with. Uh, and to me, the, those two practices are, are absolutely essential. So I, I'll also chime in real quick from, from the compliance from the compliance side, we need to be more open and transparent about why certain things are happening as well, right? Like we want this thing in this form because of, we just lost Chris, um, because of this reason, right? And and it shouldn't always just be, oh, because somebody said so, right? There's a, oh, there's a new EO, there's a new executive order. All right, but what's the intent around that? Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, the other area that we we see a lot of friction right now is just the uh, like the actual technical capabilities. So um, a lot of folks in the DoD software factory ecosystem are using SD elements, which I would say is uh, built for a let's just call it like a, a developer experience, um, but it is not built for a assessor experience, and so. Um, they might push back on me on that. And I, they shouldn't get mad at me because I have like sold the crap out of their product. And I, I think it's uh, like one of the best solutions out there, but there's a big gap right now in terms of solutions that really bridge the gap between developer and assessor in this new world where the developer and assessor are going back, you know, on a, back and forth on a day-to-day -day basis, like control, NIST control gets injected into my backlog, or, you know, I have a cross-site scripting scan and an issue gets pushed into my backlog. And now I'm working directly with the, the assessor to implement uh, a fix for that or a mitigation and get them to uh, uh, sign off on that, right? We do that in real time now. It used to be that you would build your whole software suite, hand it over to the assessors, and they would assess you for like, you know, 150 controls. And then they would come back to you with like 30 findings four months later. Uh, and like the person that developed it isn't even there anymore. And so in this new world where we've got this back and forth between developer and assessor, I think we need some better tools that better enable that collaboration. Um, and you can hack your way around it using like Slack and all kinds of things, but like, I want something that's purpose built, that's really like traceable and, and easy to, uh, uh, have transparency into from an assessor and authorizer point of view. And then some of that goes back to resource levels. I, it, it'd be hard for me to find enough to justify having that many assessors on staff to, to be embedded with, um, with the development teams. Yeah, absolutely. I would not advocate for having like one to, on every dev team. I think it's good when you're like piloting a new project. So like if you were going to start a new software factory, like the first app team putting an assessor on there, I think that's that's good. Once you get to scale, you're absolutely right. It's completely unaffordable and not a good use of resources either. Um, that's when having the tool to enable that back and forth where like you could have one assessor that's managing like four or five teams and they're maybe getting like, to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe like up to 10 um, control implementation review requests every day. Uh, and that's something that they can keep up with. And they're also, keep in mind, not bogged down with their normal calendar of like, I've got a one week review on this system, then I've got a one week review on this system. It's like, no, it's always ongoing. So they're able to dynamically respond to whichever team has an issue right now and needs to deploy to production. Brian, you might have 
answered the next question already uh, and, and kind of flipping the perspective a bit from developers to system owners. Uh, it can be a difficult, it can be a learning curve and a new en endeavor for the auditing uh, community uh, when it comes to cloud, PaaS, control inheritance, DevSecOps, uh, you know, et cetera. What approaches have you found successful to bring along compliance SMEs on the journey? Uh, and uh, that you, you may have just answered that, uh, but if you could expound, that'd be great. Yeah, maybe over to Keith if he has any thoughts okay, on what yeah. I just said there. Yeah, so I um, I like, I really enjoy when I find another compliance person that has gone through some side of the the technical body of work because I think I think it's eye opening for decisions that we make, how it impacts them, and and both sides decisions from the technical side, how how we need to kind of understand them, um, and if we we have lots of people that are are well well read on all the NIST documents, right? They, they can spit out words all the time, but have they ever actually done any of the technical work on the side? And I think that's that's one area we need to, to find a way to kind of bridge, whether it's through job rotation, whether it's through uh, the hip pocket work that you were talking about, where an assessor sits sits with the development team when they're, they're first starting out, standing out their app, um, or, or if it's, train and giving people access to to lab work or whatever it is to to work on and and hone and um hone in on their their technical skills i think that will help um that, that that's all i got uh yeah i think related to that training you know that probably brings up the number one um i'll i'll give a few but the number one that we have trouble addressing a lot of times just because we're coming from the industry side uh is a lot of folks on the government or even like uh, more of the like embedded government support contractors that support uh, cybersecurity are worried about their jobs. And so I think that, um, you know, certainly that might be the government's responsibility to like address those fears in a real way too. like make sure you have a plan for those people, whether it's training and reskilling or making sure they understand what their role is in the future and that it still exists. Um, but um coming from the industry perspective, it's something that I often have to, you know, educate the the transformation leader that I'm working with on, like, you have to address this really early. In our recent one, we it, it got ahead of us and it's caused a lot of problems um, for sure. So that's a big one. Um, a couple other things. Uh, I'm glad you keep going to like that side of the pendulum of like what the cyber folks need to do. On the ADO side, um, I think, you know, Chris brought up hack your bureaucracy. You can't hack a system you don't understand. Um, so I always tell folks like, if you want to continuously deploy your apps um, and that doesn't that pathway doesn't exist for you today, you have to understand that pathway. And instead of saying like, I'm gonna bring the compliance me like on the journey. Um, I mean, you're doing that, but again, words kind of matter and, and it depends on who you're talking to and when you're talking to. It's more, that makes it seem like I need you to come do things my way versus um, I would tell you on the ADO side, or, or even if you're coming in and implementing a continuous ATL, like your number one goal is to make NIST, RM, uh, I, I'm primarily based in RMF, right? So um, anybody that's like a NIST RMF compliance SME, like I need them to believe that I'm a NIST compliance SME, which I, I am, right? But that's the way I need to talk. I need to talk to them in terms of like NIST 800, uh, 37, you know, 53, like what rev we using, let's talk about privacy. Let's like, I have to be like, that needs to be the focus of my conversation actually upfront and, and showing them that I'm going to do all of those things in this way. Um, rather than saying like, Hey, I'm going to do all this automation and like, yeah, we'll answer all the NIST controls. It's like establishing that rapport of like, I care about NIST compliance, just like you do. I also, you had mentioned earlier in this, and I want to give quick, quick kudos. Privacy was just mentioned for the first time this entire time. So, and, and I don't think that's discussed enough, but you had mentioned earlier, having you, you have playbooks already built. And so playbooks that have worked at one agency may need to be tweaked and changed to be able to fit because we're all doing things differently. All of our interpretations different. Um, and so we can't just, just because you've built something at one federal agency and were able to get it authorized, you can't bring that over to us and say, you got to do it this way. It's, you know, review, review what, how we do things and, and let's adjust. And, you know, welcome back, Chris. 
Yeah. Hundred percent. We've done uh, many CATO implementations from the ground up, and not one of them has been the same. Uh, so, you know, going from Air Force to Space Force was mind blowing, since they just came out of the same organization or just split off. Um, was very different. And then, you know, we recently established a continuous ATO at the VA, and uh, completely different. Um, in fact, so much different uh, than I was expecting that it's like. Um, it's really caused me to think along the lines of what you're talking about here of like, how do we start to standardize some of these? Cause it's primarily like people aspects and like some local policy, but um, it made me realize how much my relationships have helped me get the continuous ATOs in the DOD side. And then going into a new agency, it's like, wow, uh, I forgot how big of a barrier the like rapport and, uh, and, and trust and all of that is and how long it takes to build inside of a new organization. So um, definitely with you on that. Like the the playbooks aren't going to be u- ubiquitous because uh, they're it's really a, a people and trust uh, kind of a game, and uh, that's going to be highly dependent on who's on the ground at any given time, even within the same organization. Yeah, we all have different missions, right? And so it's yeah. I wanted to expand on something that you said earlier, Brian, uh, as far as you the the auditors and you know, the language around bringing them along for the journey, uh, something in terms of, you know, right now immediate, uh, that I found is just to one, include them in the process, uh, you know, as you're going through, uh, you know, either whether that's mapping or implementing security controls, uh, but then two, just emp- empathizing with their current challenge. Uh, you know, something that we've seen is that like oftentimes, you know, for auditors or, or that compliance community, you know, some of these things that we throw around, you know, where there's like, you know, cloud native Kubernetes, uh, you know, a, a myriad of, you know, specific uh, tools across uh, cloud providers, you know, some of uh, them could be seeing these uh, tools for the first time. Uh, and so explaining things at that level, you know, kind of uh, going back to what you're saying about explain, explaining them in the language that they understand and, and making sure that those translations are, are accurate, I think is something that's critically important. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to your, you, know, you can't hack a system you understand. I think a lot of that comes from, you know, a, a real like master can explain something effectively to both a novice and another master um, and really being able to, you know, have your, when you're going through an audit, having people understand, you know, the different personas involved and kind of what levels and, you know, kind of that translationary piece that they need to speak to, I think is critical. And and that's not a negative thing. That's just, uh, you know, the ability of moving through and explaining a system that they may just be seeing for the first time in language that they understand and having that translation be accurate. You had, you had mentioned, um, you know, that they, on the developer side, they need to do a better job of explaining to the compliance side. And so I, I feel like it, that's putting all the onus on the developer side and that's not fair, right? Like our side needs to be empathetic. We need to understand what they're trying to do, why they're doing it. We need to stay up to date on technology processes, uh, policy, right? I, I asked somebody recently why we're still asking for something as an artifact and they, they responded with a, a document that was dated 2005 and i'm like well that's a really long time ago right is that the only thing you're basing this off of um so like we 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 own part of this conversation and it's not fair for for just the dev side to to take ownership of that life's not fair <laughs> one thing i'll say that this is like a big philosophy of my personal philosophy um i didn't come up with it uh lots of people talk about it but uh you know fault and responsibility don't go together and in government transformation that's especially the case um I just like want to be realistic at some point that most of the time the people wanting to deploy applications faster are the application developers. Um, I have certainly met a lot of security professionals that are forward leaning and have like slow app teams, uh, but uh, that's the exception, not the rule. And so um, I always want to encourage people like don't just don't expect it. If you get an assessor or, or anybody from compliance that comes along with you, that is great. Um, but don't expect it and, and you should take responsibility, even though it's not your fault, uh, and figure out how to get your application into continuous delivery. And, and that's going to involve you crossing the aisle, not dragging them across it. Uh, and so that, that's like, I think the best advice I could give to anybody trying to do this is like cross the aisle. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a drag. Right. <laughs> and that, that's the only thing, right? Like we should be, we should be willing partners on, on yeah. that. Yeah, I think you guys are spot on. I lost connectivity. I apologize. Thanks for Lloyd for uh, fielding the final question with you guys. 
from from the panel. Uh, but I think you guys are spot on in the sense that, you know, it has to be a cooperative endeavor. And ultimately, we have to realize that all these teams, all these individuals are working on the same mission for the same purpose. Uh, and that's the kind of the key that we need to keep in mind. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, we, we had some Q&A come in here. I lost connectivity, so I don't see the questions. So, Lloyd, if you want to see if there's any questions in there we want to tackle or if folks want to drop them in the chat now, uh, feel free to do so, please. I'm not seeing any questions so far. Oh, uh, we're talking a bunch about process and compliance. How do we improve security from John, John Brooks? I would say great processes and great compliance would ultimately lead to uh, uh, a better security posture. Yeah, I think I wanted to, I wanted to pile on that, especially in particular to like Brian's comment earlier about, you know, the compliance doesn't equal security trope. Um, you know, that is true. And it's a bit of a complicated topic in the sense that in the federal industry and DOD and in the industry in general, you know, compliance becomes the target or the end goal versus just part of doing good security. Um, and we kind of give it a negative connotation for that reason. Uh, but it would be very hard to be secure without being compliant because secure or security means something different to every single person you're going to speak to. So having compliance standards lets us rally around a you know kind of a standardized way of doing things within a large complex environment. Uh, so I don't think that two, the two can exist without each other. And I think we need to kind of move past that 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 you know language basically. Yeah, yeah. I'll go back to uh, kind of that spectrum of like you know, in, in technology, it's like unknown and known. And on the far left, you have like agile and lean startup. And, you know, um, on the far right side, you have things like lean six Sigma. Uh, so the same applies to any known and unknown information. It's like explore versus exploit paradigm. And so if you have known issues, they're going to lend themselves really well to compliance and checklists. Um, now, when you're doing that at an enterprise level, necessarily, that means you're going to have things on the checklist that aren't relevant to everybody. But another like NIST step that people don't take advantage of is control tailoring. Um, and you should be able to go to your compliance folks and be like, hey, these 50 controls don't apply to us. And here's why. And they're like, OK, agreed. And now that's no longer part of your compliance program. So it's so easy to get away from all these arguments people make against compliance. Um, but then on the explore side, I think once you have the fundamentals down of all of those known issues and then doing some of the more like technical, I don't want to say innovative, they've been around for a while, but like incorporating SAST and DAST and, and things into your pipeline uh, that you should be doing anyways, but doing it on every commit. Um, there's things that you can do to keep improving both your timeliness um, and your quality uh, and then going into exploration, right? Um, instead of doing pen testing, like once a quarter, which is usually limited by the fact that you can't respond to everything, right? Um, or some people only do it once a year. And it's not because the pen testers aren't available. It's because you aren't available to respond to all of the findings that they have. And you're still working on the ones from last year. Once you get to the point where you can respond to most of their, you know, like highs and mediums in like 24 hours or one week, you know, you, you can start getting into this cadence where you're doing a lot more exploration. And that's where you're going to get even more uh, and better security outcomes beyond what's on the compliance checklist, which is only what was known yesterday, not what's today and tomorrow, so. Yeah, Keith, I think you had a comment you were gonna jump in there with. I did, um, and I, I was just pleasantly surprised to hear, hear mentioning tailoring your control set, right? Because we we do see that as a, as a real issue that people do not do that because the baseline is there and provided for you you just assume that you have to satisfy everything in that baseline and th there's room to change that. Yeah. Oh, that brings up, you, you just made me think of two compensatory controls. It's yeah. like another big one that gets overlooked when you want to bring, especially commercial technology. And it's like, Oh, well, this isn't fed ramp moderate. And it's like, well, Hey, if we put Okta in front of this and like did this implementation, do you think that would solve the like outlying issues? The reason why that's not fed ramp yet. Oh yeah. We can accept that. Like it's only going to be in the development environment and it's not pulling any like sensitive data. Okay. Uh, so like compensatory controls are, are a big one too that get overlooked even by assessors. 
yeah, the, the reality is there's nuance there in the environments and the controls and the implementations of the controls. Uh, we also had a, a question come in, and Ken, I'll let you go first, Keith, because I think you were going to jump back in there. Uh, it says, oftentimes we have AOs and ISSMs from different organizations do and accept things differently. How do we as an industry enforce a general standard, or is that something we want to enforce from the top down? And I'm curious your guys' perspective, but from mine, I don't know if this is something that we can always have a general standard or only one way of doing things because all the environments and missions are unique and different. And we need to have some kind of general language and way of doing things as a best practice, but there has to be some kind of nuance in there as well. So I, I was going to say along the similar line, one, the last thing we need is another standard out there published, right? Because there, there's already enough of them. And, and two, I, I think the ones that all are out there already have enough flexibility for you to manage whatever you need to do, um, however you need to do it. And every organization needs to be able to build out their program that meets their needs. Not, not everyone has the same mission, right? DOD and CMS are two very different federal entities. And so their mission may be, is the warfighter and protecting the nation and all, all our interests and all that stuff. And then CMS is, you know, helping provide medical care to to citizens. So like, we, we, we need different processes and, and procedures for each of those. Yeah, I agree with that. And usually people that have roughly the same mission are using the same framework. So like all of DOD and I think DHA and certainly VA are all using RMF as an example, right? You're gonna have different baselines within there. Um, for you know DOD, we've got like IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, IL-6, top secret overlays. You've got other kinds, you know, you've got a PII overlay, depending on what kind of data you're bringing in. So there's like different overlays, but the standard is all the same. I think where people, look, I'm tired of the, the LinkedIn stuff that's going on where people don't get an authorization or they don't get reciprocity. And they're like blaming ignorant AOs and isms when the truth is they haven't done any controls documentation. I like reach out to these, hey, can I see your controls? Like, I'd like to see why they didn't improve it. And it's like, you know, oh, our controls are in Git. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, no, they're not. And I think, um, you know, if you have gone through NIST and you can show, even if you've done control tailoring and you have compensatory controls, if you can demonstrate that clearly and competently, it's rare that I've seen that somebody won't say like, yeah, I'll let my app deploy on that platform or, uh, hey, we'll we'll deploy that platform in our environment and accept that. It, and usually, if anything, it's like, hey, I'm not comfortable with these two things. Swap that out and we're good. And, or like, you have to use our identity provider. Okay. And those conversations end up being really easy when you have solid documentation, which is a result of solid processes and um, and, and a good compliance program. Any final, any final thoughts on that from you, Lloyd, before we uh, take us out? Uh, just that something that might help is, you know, if you do have that solid documentation, you know, maybe packaging that in, in such a way that's shareable for the greater community. Uh, you know, if you, if you really do have, uh, you know, these types of things in terms of reusable components, uh, you know, certain pieces of technology tied to certain control sets in a manner that uh, other programs can leverage, you know, share that out, um, you know, bring the benefits to the larger federal community as a whole. Yeah, spot on there. I think if you've done the work, you should be willing to show the work. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to take us out. That's the final question we had from the audience. I want to be uh, you know mindful of your guys' time and thank Lloyd, Keith, and Brian for joining us today, as well as everyone who tuned in. And hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for hosting.